Welcome to KJV Cafe, where the truths of God's Word come alive. Grab a hot cup of coffee or tea and spend some time learning about our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Listen now to Pastor Clark Covington of Heartland Community Baptist Church as he explores great insights from the Word of God. Amen. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. My name is Pastor Clark Covington, pastor of Heartland Community Baptist Church, Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Amen. Good to be here today. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you got a hot cup of coffee or tea. I'm on episode three of a multi-part series in the Lord's letter to the church of Philadelphia from the book of Revelation. And really, I was just getting started and the episode was over in part two. So yeah, that's radio time. It's not cheap. Amen. We only get our little block here. So we're going to start right back up. I'm going to buy up the time. I guess I've been a little too uh, casual so far in these episodes, but we're in part three of a multi-part series dealing with what we are to do in the new year. This idea of we're in the end times and it's a new year, or we're in the last days and it's a new year. This juxtaposition of starting something new, but we're at the end. And how the Lord would have us to live and act in this time. And I spent a lot of time on 1 Timothy 4.8 in the last couple episodes. Uh, so I won't spend too much time there. We're going to go right into Revelation 3. And we're going to look at that. Uh, Revelation 3.11 is our text verse. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And so Jesus is writing here to the church of Philadelphia that he is coming quickly that we are that the Church of Philadelphia was to hold fast to what they had, that no one would take their crown. And so what does that mean and what does it have to do with us? Well, I was just getting to that in the last episode about how the Church of Philadelphia and the fundamental church, fundamental independent church, has a lot in common. But let me read Revelation 3, 7 through 13. This is the whole letter that Jesus writes to the Church of Philadelphia. Then I'm going to give you a, pro- a profile of the Church of Philadelphia, and we'll see if we can't get some parallels drawn here today. Amen. I'm just excited to be here, and I'm so, I'm so excited you're listening today. And uh, I promise you, you'll be blessed by this, not by anything I've said, but by the Word of God. Revelation 3, 7 through 13, red letter text, Jesus speaking. Uh, through uh, John on the Isle of Patmos here. Uh, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Wow, this is a very powerful letter here from Jesus Christ to the church of Philadelphia that we really can take a lot from we being uh, saved Christians that believe the Bible is the true word of God and that live by God's holy word. Uh, The Church of Philadelphia was one of the seven churches addressed in Revelation. They're located in modern-day Turkey, which back then was referred to as Asia Minor. The church was weak in some respects, of little strength, the idea of being exiled from the synagogue by unbelieving Jews that persecuted the church. I believe that's what it meant Uh, The scriptures mean by saying the church was weak, of little strength. The unbelieving Jews, they were at one point lumped up with the Church of Philadelphia and other Christian believers. Remember Paul in his letters, typically when he would go to a new place, uh, he was kind of the first missionary. He was the first missionary. He'd always go to the synagogue, right? And back then it wasn't controversial. Me being a Christian, 
being a preacher, it'd be kind of controversial if I went to the synagogue today. Now, I'm sure they would welcome me, and I have no reason to believe they wouldn't. And I always look at a Jewish individual as God's chosen group, God's chosen people, and one that God is not done dealing with, one that God has never given up on, and one that the Lord will soon return to as the church is raptured out. Uh, But it would still be controversial for me to be a Christian to go into a synagogue. But these early Christians, it wasn't controversial at first. It was just how things were done. They were under Roman rule, as I understand it. The Romans had kind of grandfathered in uh, the Jewish faith so that Jews had autonomy. They could worship. They could, uh, you know, they could perform their sacrifices. They could live how they wanted to live for the most part. They still had to, you know, pay their taxes. They had to give Caesar what was Caesar's. They had to live according to the Roman laws, but they weren't viewed as, say, um, unsurping authority as, say, a rebel group, as, say, one that would try to overthrow the government. And you say, well, that, why would they be viewed as that? Well, back then, religion and government, they were one and the same. And so there was, uh, you know, the Romans were pagans. They had all kinds of false gods. Eventually, they said Caesar's God. There was all kinds of just blatant pagan worship at that time. And so if you were to say that you serve this other God and that you, you're monotheistic, which means one, right, instead of poly, polytheistic. I need to Google that and make sure I don't mess that up. But if you're monotheistic, that means you serve one God. Yeah, yeah, there we go. I just searched it up here. Monotheistic, relating to or characterized by the belief that there is only one God. Okay, so if you are that, then you'd, uh, you'd potentially be very offensive to the Romans, but you're not when you're uh, uh, part of the Jewish faith because you've been lumped in with that group, you've been grandfathered in. They say, okay, they're not a threat. Let them do what they're going to do. We'll respect it. Well, the Church of Philadelphia, if they're exiled by the Jewish community, what Jesus calls the synagogue of Satan, that they say they're Jews as in, as in believers in the true God, but are not, then if you're exiled by them, then uh, politically you're in trouble. Now you look like a rebel group, right? Now you look like you're breaking rules because you're not buying into all these pagan gods. You're monotheistic and you're not in line with the Jews. Now you're a threat. Now the Jews don't like you either. And by the way, you were going to their synagogue for <clears throat> all cultural events, everything, right? Work probably some was evolved there, at least networking, if not actual jobs came from there. Uh, Weddings, funerals, birthdays, education, I, I could imagine would probably be part of that. Cer- certainly religious education, if not all education, on and on and on. Child care. I mean, all of it probably was based in the synagogue, as I understand. I'm not just guessing. I did As I did my research, there was a lot of um, uh, discussion about how the synagogue played a major role in society and in the culture. So back to the Church of Philadelphia, they have been what? They've been booted out. They've been exiled. And Jesus says, you know what? You kept my word. So they, they, didn't, they didn't say, okay, we'll compromise for worldly convenience, worldly privilege, and so on. They didn't deny his name. Jesus says that he, they didn't deny his name. They held fast to his word of patience, not giving up and being patient in affliction. And so think about this. As a church today, if you believe that the that God's word is infallible and perfect, true from cover to cover, that, that Jesus really did die for your sins and for the sins of all mankind, and that it was a substitutionary death, and that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, and that we need a Savior, and that we are to live holy and separate, that we are to... We're not under the law, but we don't abandon it. We don't, we're not under the law, but it doesn't mean I throw the Ten Commandments out the window and live in sin, but that I have faith in God, that the same God that made those commandments would have me to live under those to bring glory and honor to Jesus. The Bible says, Jesus Christ himself says, if you love me, obey my commandments. I mean, that's a very powerful verse. And again, we're not under the law. We're not saved by living right. We're saved by our faith, by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. That's the only way we're saved but we live right because we're saved. We're saved, we get the Holy Spirit, and then we live right. We depart from sin. And so think about the modern church faces great persecution. From day one, the Lord called me to plant a church. I have always kept it fundamental. By the book, by the Bible, our founding verses, Romans uh, 10, 9 through 10. 
And we are all about salvation. We're all about the blood. We're all about the inherency of scripture. We're all about the book. Amen. Preaching hell hot and heaven sweet. And our congregation has not been invited to any big conferences. We are, uh, we, we've not gotten on every radio station we've applied to be on. I'll put it that way. Um, we don't get a ton of people banging our door down to come worship with us on and on and on. You say, well, is that really persecution? Well, I don't know if it's persecution, but surely uh, I could tell you what's successful. I could look and see what church has filled up the most. You know, you kind of like look, okay, who's got the biggest attendance and what are they doing? And I could tell you that that's completely 100% opposite to how we worship and has thrown, thrown God's word under the bus and has created a business out of uh, God's holy word and a perversion and a new age preaching that deals with tickling the ears and trying to entertain people and elevate that entertainment over and over again. And so the modern church uh, is so different than the fundamental church. And if you're a fundamental church and you're living for the Lord and you're part of that church and you can't have fellowship with someone that is living carnally, right? Because you are to be set apart and you got someone that quote goes to church and they're drinking every night, they're cursing up a storm, they're cheating on their spouse, they're gambling their, their, their days away on and on and on. And you say, well, I really don't have anything in common with you. I believe those things are sin. Watch out, you know, watch out. And I saw t- someone on television years ago and his audience was shrinking and the donations were shrinking. And he said, I don't know what's going on. And I think it was his son said, dad, you're preaching about sin. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, that's how things get uh, difficult in this life. And that's how God's allowed it. Amen. That's how God's allowed it. And so the Church of Philadelphia was dealing with that. They weren't denying the name of Christ. They weren't changing uh, the scriptures. They were faithful to his word. They were faithful to who he was. Of course, they didn't have uh, the, you know, everything that we have now in terms of resources to study the scriptures. But what they did have, they were faithful to it. They're faithful to the gospel. And Jesus then goes and makes seven promises, including that those persecutors of this church would fall at their feet and admit and acknowledge his love for the church of Philadelphia and that they would be vindicated. Jesus goes on to say they'd be made pillars in the temple as in never leaving. There'd be a permanency to them. Think about the poetic nature of that, that they are cast away. They have no permanent home. They have no big synagogue. They have no big church. They're they are exiled, amen. They are in trouble, and they're weak, and, and, and it looks like anyone could storm their door down. And Jesus is saying, I'm opening the door, and nobody can shut it. And I'm going to make you a pillar, and no one will be able to, to deny it because they're going to bow down at your feet and acknowledge that I love you. Because what was the implication? That they weren't truly worshiping and loving the true living God. And the implication was that the living God wouldn't be satisfied with them because of what they believed that Christ died for their sins. And so because they believe the true gospel, Jesus is saying they'll be vindicated. And so we too, as the fundamental church today, can say, you know what, Lord? We will be vindicated in heaven. So many have looked at us as kooks and as extremists and as old-fashioned and as outdated and as not progressive enough and as whatever it is. We look, we're looked at like that, amen? Uh, and I've heard things, you know, through my years at ministry that just, just make me shake my head. And I've been involved before the uh, Lord called me to plant a church in several churches, and I've seen it, amen? I've seen uh, if you don't compromise what happens, and it's hard, amen? It's difficult, And yet we believe with all our heart and soul that like the Church of Philadelphia, one day we will be made um, pillars in God's house, that we will receive a reward. And that's what Jesus is getting to. That's what we're going to talk about next episode is that this crown, this reward of this crown, like an Olympic medal that we receive for our uh, earthly service to the Lord and faithfulness to the Lord, don't let anyone take it. And we're going to look at how someone can take it and why uh, they would take it, and, and why and how we can make sure they don't do that uh, in the next episode, because for time's sake, we don't have time today. But just today, thank God for those that are staying close to the book, staying to the Word, living for Him. Praise God today for that. Tune in next time as we get to deep deeper into Revelation 3. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. God bless, and amen. Thanks for visiting the cafe today. Our goal is to inspire you with the truth and depth of God's Word in a straightforward manner. Do you know Jesus? You can today. Visit kjvcafe.com to learn more about God's great plan of salvation for all of mankind. 
Until next time, remember, as Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 puts it, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness.